our Commerce Reimagined series, highlighting change makers, visionaries, and the people that are changing the way we are defining innovation and technology um, for us, oftentimes in commerce, but way beyond that when we think about different enterprises and companies. So I am excited today to welcome our guest, Sheetal Rishi. She's the Global Director of Cloud AI at IBM. Her role is at the intersection of digital innovation, marketing, e-commerce, and technology. So a perfect person for us to speak to today. She's been a pioneer in connecting technology to business growth and helps organizations drive innovation to survive, simplify, and I like this, super scale their business through IBM's cloud and, and, and AI. She is constantly inspired to solve real world problems. And I know we'll get into a few of those stories in our conversation today um, using prediction capabilities. She is also someone obviously who pioneers the areas of diversity and inclusion um, at, in a passionate and a way that's all about how we democratize technology. So with that, I'd like to welcome Sheetal to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was a, that's a wonderful introduction by the way I was like keep saying <laughs> it sounds very interesting um, it's an absolute delight to be speaking with you today and um, thank you again for having me well that's all you so we're, we're honored to be able to speak to you and learn from your experiences so let's dive right in um, there's been a recent study that you shared from IBM Institute for Business Value that showed that the average tech savvy organizations have outperformed their peers not surprising by six percentage points across 12 industries where technology has acted as a performance differentiator. IBM has been on the forefront of this technology, as we know, driving this adoption, specifically with the adoption of cloud, AI, and mobile. So let's start by defining for everyone, what does this mean? You know, what big changes have you seen over the past eight months in terms of digital transformation for companies and how is IBM scaling this effort? Specifically, really focusing on what does it mean? What does digital transformation for companies mean today? Perfect. Um, sure, absolutely. And what an year it has been for all of us, and the world is completely turned upside down, right? Um, and as you said, let's just start with what's the definition of digital transformation first, right? Um, to me, digitization means when we start using technologies, different types of technologies at the core of running our business. It could be front end, could be middle office, could be back office. And the term transformation, in my opinion, I think it defines, it applies most closely to incumbents and traditional businesses that have existed for decades and have operated in a certain fashion all along these years, including IBM, by the way, right? Um, so digital transformation is the ability of businesses at all levels to be able to reinvent themselves and then be able to use technology to compete with the digital disruptors, right? Um, in the last eight to 10 months, um, absolutely clear that the pandemic has pushed the speed of digital transformation at exponential levels. Organizations that were previously either resistant or they were on the fence, they have actually gone right in. The transformation journeys have compacted. Things that used to take years, I'm seeing is taking months. So to take years of planning and you know, witness, I'm, I'm literally witnessing agile in action where leaders are recognizing that good is better than the best, you know, less is more. Let's take one example that's relevant to all of us, vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, right? In non-tech times, if you will, vaccine from ideation to distribution at the end would take anywhere between eight to 10 years on an average. But now the timelines we are seeing, um, we're looking at the time condensed to about one to two years from innovation to ideation to delivering it better, faster, and cheaper. So, in terms of our own contributions, IBM's contribution, I think it's important to let's just reflect back to 110 plus years of IBM's history, right? Uh, be it core from landing our first spaceship, um, hidden figures, uh, uh, landing our first spaceship, inventing calculators, electric typewriters, to PCs, to first programming language, right? Fortran, uh, namely to building the first commercial application for AI and taking healthcare, which is one of the most challenging industries to be in to deploy any kind of AI technologies. We've been at the front end center, right? And then um, in the more modern world, uh, acquiring highest level of performance, be it quantum computing, building uh, 5G edge computing technologies. And most recently we launched our first public cloud uh, relevant for financial services and telcos, right? 
and we've constantly reinvented, reinvested in our own self. Um, and I think that's very evident from last 27 years of patent leadership, for example. So all our COVID efforts, I think, has been reflecting our own journey to the outsiders, where the focus has been helping them survive in the pandemic, uh, simplify their existing businesses, and super scale from small agile changes and building large applications that are repeated across the organization. So if I were to summarize, I think three things that we've done collectively as IBM. Number one, from an architecture perspective, given that um, the writing is on the wall, there is an entire pivot to hybrid multi-cloud strategy, which is built on our Red Hat acquisition to drive open, highly secure, and modular architecture. Uh, we've literally taken our own middleware and deployed through cloud packs that can not only run on any cloud, but also on any kind of mainframes and power systems that empowers our clients. You're not restricting or limiting them in any way. Secondly, um, I think it's pretty evident, uh, it's not for one company, it's an ecosystem, right? So we've empowered our best of breed ISVs, GSI partners with a very simple internal processes and we are ourselves going through a cultural shift to be able to drive outcomes and innovation for our clients. And largely something that's very close to my heart as well is this whole notion of corporate social responsibility, right? So things like providing free technologies to fight COVID-19, um, enabling massive developer communities outside recertification um, re program at, at, at no cost to the users. Uh, and in this whole, everything in the spirit of democratizing technology it cannot be just for you and me or a subset of the world, it has to be for everyone. And then um, also there are other corporate service programs like Reignite, which is a, a program that's meant to enable uh, white collar jobs and uh, help small businesses and um, job seekers find new jobs in the market. So I think those are some of the things that we have we are, uh, we are doing in the industry and we're seeing a significant impact um, among the users. Very impressive. And it feels like good timing for IBM to be in this space as a leader. You said one thing that I just want to get a little bit more clarity on, maybe because if I don't understand it, there might be other listeners out there who don't as well. And that is around multi-cloud. What, what does it mean when you say multi-cloud? So any... Um... Any company in this world today will not only have a single cloud, a single system of record. Keep, let's keep it very simple, right? Uh, your information could be in one cloud, say your employee or employee information in one system of record, which could reside in one cloud platform. The other, the, your customer information, for example, could reside in another system, another infrastructure, which could be a second cloud. Your customer feedback, your supply chain is all in a different cloud. It's a distributed world today. So that is what is called a multi-cloud hybrid cloud. And depending on which um, analyst you follow on an average, I think there are at least eight to 10 clouds. Every organization will have their knowledge data distributed across. So when you get single view of a customer, this would be a way of bringing that information together in an organization. Exactly, exactly. So you're not grappling between managing multiple clouds. It is a single uh, pane of glass where you can log in, you can look at your resources and resources again could be around your products, your employees, your customers, how is what's being managed, how it's distributed, how is it being secured. Um, all of that requires a, a consolidated effort, concerted effort to bring it to life. Otherwise, you are talking about a highly complex, unmanageable environment where companies will start, uh, start to lose control uh, of what's really going on in their organizations. So you mentioned COVID as an accelerator. And of course, we've seen in our own business and we've been talking to clients a lot during this past year about kind of following as quickly as possible or leading to where consumer behavior change is taking their business. And there's been you know, massive changes, obviously, in consumers now shopping online shopping on mobile devices and um, thinking about their commerce journey very, very differently. And that's driving new adoption of technology. And you guys are playing a role there in terms of how you are accelerating around the commerce space as well, uh, specifically around to right targeting of co consumer. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the work that you are doing there? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And um, I think a most exciting part of this whole e-commerce world, by the way, for me personally is uh, how can you predict my needs before even I know about them? You know, sometimes it feels creepy. You can tell me exactly when I'm going to need what and which brand I should go and buy for. So all of that is digital e-commerce, right? So uh, again, I think again, the writing is on the wall, right? 2020 holiday shopping is digital first and beyond will be even more digital first, right? Uh, with And the good news is, in my opinion, with the pandemic, um, consumers have also become very 
conscious. They are, there is a consciousness involved in making purchasing decisions. Um, there are millennials, especially, I think who are more conscious of things around sustainability, being able to support local businesses, uh, reducing the environmental impact, right? And movements like me to Black Lives Matter, I think they fundamentally influence change the way buyers uh, are buying in the market and whatever uh, spend patterns we are seeing in the industry. So for us, um, I think what we have seen is from a hybrid cloud model deployment perspective, let, let's give an example, let's take an example. Uh, from the moment you find something you want to buy on your mobile device, um, you immediately, or I, what I do is I try to look for reviews at immediate speed and scale. What are others, people like me, customers like me saying when they buy, what's their experiences before I make up my mind on what I'm going to buy. And once I've made my um, decision, there may be an element of designing or customizing what my needs are. And then, uh, then making an order. So completing my purchase, doing my transaction online, and then at the back end, as, as a delivery service provider, my, uh, my product uh, supplier would go back and look at delivery management, their inventory management, and uh, whatever else is required to actually get that product delivered to me. So this whole entire life cycle of from searching the commodity, the product, it could be product or a service, from designing, customizing it to my needs, um, then making an order, and then making the payment and then getting it delivered and then getting my consumer feedback. All of this is a life cycle itself, right? And all of these pieces of workflows could reside on multiple um, clouds, if you will. So enabling this end-to-end -end supply chain is what uh, we as IBM through a seamless end-to-end -end hybrid cloud environment is what we've been uh, working on. And it's becoming even more powerful and even more um, mainstream if you look across the board in terms of retailers or telcos or um, CPG retail clients, for example, right? So from a marketer's perspective, as you said, I think market yeah. needs, consumer expectations completely changing. Supply chains are becoming more complex and optimization to eliminate any kind of waste is paramount importance for organizations. So how do you enable all of that through technology? And at the same time, because the marketing needs have changed, consumer needs have changed, marketers have to be able to uh, allow the brands to be able to ultra personalize the messages at the hyper localized level. It's no more about saying I brought one item and everybody go buy that, that doesn't happen anymore. So doing all of that data analysis to make these predictions um, is, is, is a hard problem. It's not for humans to solve fundamentally. So a lot of our AI capabilities, for example, are centered around helping clients in this hybrid multi-cloud environment, be able to analyze the unstructured data, which is by the way, 80% of the data is unstructured even today coming in different formats at a very high velocity. So doing all of that programmatically using AI in a very uh, highly secured with uh, data security in place is what we are focusing on from our AI and hybrid cloud uh, capabilities in the market. And from a UK use case standpoint, just curious about how much of that um, do you see agencies or consulting firms or other players at the table working with you and uh, um, on behalf of a, a client or a company? Are, are you working more, more directly with clients on these issues? Um, so it's a mix of both in my own role. I'll speak for myself. Um, definitely WPP is one of my um, big clients. We work very closely with them. So it's, 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 it's the rapid uh, advancement innovation agencies are having themselves to be able to serve their brand needs directly. And then obviously the brands themselves for uh, improving their omni-channel experiences, for example, and their digital supply chains are investing very heavily to be able to make the most of their ad spend, media spend dollars. Yeah, that's exactly what we see. And, and we think there's huge opportunities as we go forward into the deployment of this tech um, with the outcomes that we're trying to drive for our clients together. Um, but it's still interesting because so many of our clients today, as they're beginning to see the, these new use cases for how AI can be deployed and, and the use of the cloud, there's still um, a bit of a disconnect sometimes. Like there, we know that we wanna to get to close to personalize, personalizing the customer experience um, and how we think about offers. But there's still so many clients that are um, haven't really moved to implement it. You know, they're they're maybe running some trials or they're getting used to it. But there's a sm much smaller percentage that are actually really operationalizing around AI right now. I would love to hear a bit more from you in terms of what you think this is all about. You know, how can brands build more inclusive technology mix? 
uh, be thinking about the right way to begin this kind of deployment if they feel like there's a bit of a hurdle internally in their in their organizations, maybe because their digital uh, acumen and IQ isn't isn't where it needs to be. Yeah, we're absolutely right. And I think that's fundamentally one of the biggest challenges the entire industry is seeing right now. I think they all recognize the need for adopting AI and advanced technologies, but often get caught up in how to start, where to start, when to stop, what decisions to make, who's your partner and things like that. So, and depending on again, which analyst you follow, the, the numbers tell us that 87 to 90% of data science and AI projects fail. They don't get out. They're not successful at all. Forget about implementation or operationalizing. That doesn't happen. So you're absolutely right, right? While AI is not magical, the impact it creates is very, very magical. Uh, but any AI is as good, in my opinion, as number one, the data it is trained on. Number two, the people challenge, right? People with relevant skills who are training it, deploying it, managing it, owning the solution end-to-end -end deployment. The third piece is the technology. Um, I don't think it, we've got to a point where these are point solutions and you click and you deploy and you get an end, end application. It's, it's a combination of cloud, how is it delivered, delivered through mobile, 5G, edge computing technologies, for example, and most importantly, the speed at which you are being able to deliver it. And then finally, obviously, the cost implications, right? The more uh, compute power you would consume to deliver AI results, the more um, cost pressures you will end up having. So. Definitely the technology that is being used to implement AI is often found to be one of the big reasons whether an AI project will be successful or not. And then lastly, this whole uh, regulatory environment for all right reasons, right? You have to be, uh, you have to ensure that the data and the tech security is in place before uh, you go and start deploying data and AI at scale, which sort of limits a lot of people in terms of adopting um, any of these technologies in my opinion. Um, for the brands, again, it's, it's a very fine balance, right? We all know that when it comes to Wall Street, Wall Street has always been brutal. That's what it's meant to be. Uh, so it's forcing brands to make difficult decisions, how to allocate your defined budget. Either you spend it against an existing operation, which has a defined preset revenue, or you invest in future technologies whose revenue, quite frankly, is unknown at this point, right? We are all going with an assumption that there are exponential results, but there are not enough benchmarks or baselines to compare it against. Technology, um, tech adoption is not going to work with a copy-paste philosophy. It, I mean, brands need to programmatically focus on the journey. It, it's a journey in itself, right? I mean, digital disruptors, the FANG group, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, uh, they've taken the risk, they've adopted the technology and are moving full steam ahead uh, and they're blurring lines between traditional industry verticals. I mean, I could be a tech company and I could still be a retail company, entertainment company, insurance, and now healthcare, all of the above in one company. It's all powered by AI. So while we're seeing the impact of AI, the brands are still catching up because of the limited resources, if you will. Again, going back to data, tech, and the skills that are required and sometimes compliance requirements as well. So, so we're, gonna, we're gonna get into in a moment, I think um, ways that we're both trying to work on getting more skills into organizations on this front. But before we go there, I'm curious whether you have a good use case, like a quick example of um, some deployment that really represents what you think is sort of where, where things are headed in terms of best in class. Um, so customer segmentation, for example, is relevant to the marketing world and the work actually we did with Wonderman Thompson um, within less, less than two weeks of time frame, we were able to build what we call the COVID-19 dashboard. And again, all of that was preset because we had a platform where the data was integrated and the data science and AI models were pre-deployed. So we were able to um, come out with an expression of, and I call it, it it's something that can help you to um, ultra personalize uh, and localize your, you could be an, you could be a retailer, you could be an um, uh, auto company, for example, based on the, how the risk readiness and recovery at a zip code level is coming along, uh, along in a particular zip code, you could determine your inventory, you could determine your supply chains, you could go figure out how many to start for, for example. So those decisions enablement powered by AI through a COVID-19 risk readiness recovery dashboard that's been built with Wonderman Thompson, I think is a classic example of an expression. And again, remember because we had the invested in that AI platform, the ability to build this application in less than two weeks is at a speed that's completely unknown of is actually enabled us to make that happen. Exactly. We've been involved with them on just different creative um, explorations of that in terms of how it could be deployed against a couple of different creative solutions. So 
um, I think that's a great example of like, if you build it, the opportunity will come on the backs of it once, once it's in place. So moving exactly. into the, the talent challenge that we do face, I know that WPP and IBM recently announced a women's network called Grow, which was launched by um, your Michelle Peluso on your side, and of course, Mark Reed for WPP. Um, this is like a new tech education and mentoring network that's open to women um, at all experience levels, you know, in different job functions in order to address some of this diversity issue in tech and um, to you know, help further against this real diversity need that we see. Can you tell us a little bit more about GROW and um, why you think um, it's particularly relevant right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, one of my theme projects, if I can, right, GROW Women and Tech. Uh, again, I think it's the, uh, we've, we've discussed this enough. Uh, we know AI is strategic to organizations. It's, it's a requirement. It's a necessity more than, uh, it's not a question of choice anymore from a technology perspective, right? So what is GROW? GROW is, to me, is an informal, risk-free networking platform to connect uh, anyone who identifies themselves as he, uh, as she, her or hers to come together and share their unique accomplishments, right? Ask questions, get answers from segment of people who are alike, who are like you versus going to any larger environment or larger ecosystem. So that's how Grove came to mind. And then the idea was very simple. And uh, since it's COVID, we didn't really have to worry too much about bringing people together and planning and securing resources. I think that also had a role to play. So this was a virtual, um, it started off as a virtual event. And again, the intention is to be able to provide a platform, create a sisterhood of women in ad tech and MarTech to support each other. And uh, I'll give you one, and again, this is a real story, why we did this, my own social experiment, right? I tried to verify, there was a lot of news articles, if you go and press, and depending on what you follow, there's like, oh, there are less women, more women need to be on the platform and more and leadership position and whatnot. And I said, wait a minute, let me just prove it to myself. So uh, in the pandemic, what I started doing was over the last two months, I took it eight weeks of data. It's again, it's not huge data, but I, uh, I started recording in about hundred virtual meetings I went to. I started tracking how many uh, women, what's a woman to men ratio. I was shocked. What I found was at the end, there were 95% of the meetings that I went to had less than 5% women. Forget about the other spectrum of diversity. So that to me was my watershed moment that, okay, something more um, programmatically has to be done. And most of my meetings uh, are centered around data science and AI and how do you bring clients along on the hybrid cloud journey. So that to me was what triggered this whole grow idea. Now to your other question, why is it important? Uh, see, diversity itself, similarity kills innovation, right? If I all, we all talk and speak the same language, um, I don't think we'll be able to, able to innovate. The, the, the ability of us to challenge each other and um, uh, question each other and for, collaborate with each other creates more beautiful things. Rainbow is never will never be as beautiful as it is if it was not multicolored, right? So it was about it, and it's not about creating a rivalry against genders or people with different backgrounds, but it's building. It's about building a balanced society driven by equality that is simply based on meritocracy. That's it. Period. There should no. There shouldn't be anything else. I could be anyone, in terms of who I look like, how I think, what I sort language I speak, where I come from, but based on my meritocracy, I should be able to play in a level field. So, and, and keep the financials on the side for large organizations, right? It's, there's enough evidence that wherever there's diversity, the results are much better. So we've enough evidences around that. And there are, and we also know that there are a lot of gaps and there have been enough science experiments that have been done to prove that, um, for example, in the mortgage industry, uh, we know we've done enough studies that have proven that a lot of mortgage loan applications were denied outrightly based on highly gender biased relative features, which is completely unwarranted. So I think it was time to create a level ground field that will generate equal opportunities for all of us. And um, as, as that being one of the underpinning, that's how GROW came about. And we just got it started. We're very excited for the program and looking forward to what it brings to all very of us. Very excited for the program. I look forward to being involved as well and supporting it. And, and thank you for the push on that. I want to end with a very quick question. So we've talked a lot about how the data and the AI helps us perform better at our predictions. So I'm going to ask you one without the data in front of you for your own personal prediction as you are so close to AI and, and how it's being leveraged by brands, big and small, 
What, why don't you give us one or two of your predictions as we look ahead um, from an, an AI standpoint and what, what you see in the future? Yeah, I think um, I have I call it hopes and fears, I think. Let's put it that way, my predictions. Uh, my hope is where I see it, every company of the future will be an AI company. There will be new roles that are not existing today. The data steward, data engineers, data scientists, CDOs, chief analytics officer, whatnot, they'll all be there. And I think there'll be many more billion dollars created uh, that will be servicing local needs on a global platform. And I think all of this good tech would be used more extensively for tackling problems like climate change, environmental issues, predicting better crop outputs, protecting sea life, extincting resource, extincting resources and whatnot. So that is my hope. And I think that that vision will come to life. My biggest fear is that unless there is a programmatic structured intervention by different country heads, it's not about one country, it's not about US versus rest of the world anymore. Unless everybody from every part of the globe comes together, Unfortunately, we'll end up seeing a much wider gap in terms of uh, economic scale of living across the world if it is not taken care of because AI is here, it's here to stay and it will create exponential um, impact for the rest of the world. So I just, I just wish, that's my fear or wish that you know, things change and we live in a more distributed democratized world where everybody has access to these resources. Well, it's both sobering, but also very inspiring as we head into a new year. So thank you, Sheetal, so much for sharing your time and your insights with us. Look forward to more conversations like this. And of course, for people who are interested in learning more, please look out for Sheetal on LinkedIn, um, Sheetal Ricci and myself at Beth Ann Kamenko.